Okay, we're we're recording. Hi, we made it. Hi. Welcome everyone to our interview. Sorry it didn't work out on Facebook, but we've got Zoom for a backup here, so we're recording this for you. I hope you enjoy it. So like I was saying on Facebook, I met Clark two years ago when he came into the store and he started telling me stories about when he used to look for dinosaur tracks and other rock hounding adventures and we just totally clicked and we've been friends ever since for the past two years and Clark is a very interesting guy and very creative and he has lots of stories and tips about rock hunting and I just wanted to share that with you and so let's see so the, my first question is for you is to tell everyone how you got into so first of all I this just came up that I was calling him a rock hound, but he doesn't like that term. Why don't you like the term rock hound? I always think of a rock hound as a, an older person who's retired in a motorhome and kicking around the countryside <laughs> collecting rocks that don't have any value. And I, I, <laughs> I call myself a prospector because oh, okay. I'm, looking for, I'm looking for items of value and high dollar pieces. So that's Okay, well that makes sense. Well, then a prospector can also be the old guy on the donkey, too, so you never know. That's true. <laughs> so how did you get into prospecting? What, what was the thing that got you into it? Uh, when I was a kid, my mom was equally curious, and so was my father. So we would travel a lot to Eastern Oregon and other remote places looking for, usually it was based around deer hunting or some other activity my father was doing, but it was usually a family activity. And we would frequently look for arrowheads and depression glass and I think there's that early childhood discovery and that led into uh, obsidian and other minerals. And then I turned that, that switch off for a long time. And when I was 20, I, uh, before art school, I decided to re-engage with it and I hitchhiked to Arizona from Oregon. And I got out of the car thinking, I'm in Arizona, this is where all the minerals are. I'm just gonna pick them up off the ground. And I couldn't find anything. Uh, so I uh, went to a local store and I asked a woman in, in Sedona, I said, you know, do you know any place I can go find minerals? Like I've always wanted to dig crystals. And she said, well, there is this place down the road when I was a kid, we used to go look. And so I went down the road and went right where she told me to. And I found um, some uh, deposits of aragonite in the hillside of this riverbed. And I dug them out and put them into a flat and took them back to the same store and sold them to her for $200. And after wow. that, I was hooked. Like, that's cool. That's how I that's how I kind of fell into it the first time. And then I uh, worked for a while in selling minerals in Sedona and South for a while, uh, when I was 20 to like 21, maybe 20 and a half. And uh, I went to art school and I didn't look for minerals for 25 years. And uh, cool. a few years ago when I met you, that's when I re-engaged in my passion for it. And I've learned a lot from you since then. And um and you were also looking for tracks, right? And when you were in college, you also found some prehistoric animal tracks? Yeah, there's a very small lizard-like creature from the Permian era, which is about 280 to 300 million years ago. And there's a formation in Northern Arizona called the Coconino Formation. And it was when Northern Arizona, near, near Flagstaff, west of Flagstaff, was roughly where Costa Rica is now. Pangea, the whole continent has drifted that far. And when these tracks were laid down, this was a very shallow, sandy beach, just a little bit of water. It probably the land hadn't risen much. This is one of the very first animals to crawl out of the goo. And it's a small lizard-like animal, four toes. And it leaves footprints across these uh, beaches. And then it would harden in the sun. And then another layer would come in after that of sediment and then fill that in. And so there was a rumor these were out in northern Arizona and I looked for weeks in all these quarries of sandstone plates and lift up a plate after plate after plate and nothing. And uh, one day I was hiking to the top of a mesa and got to the very top of the mesa. This is one of the most mind boggling things about geologic history that, that really kind of shook me. I was hiking up this mesa in the middle of the Arizona desert and of course these are flat top mountains and I get to the top and I start seeing seashells and then uh, uh, different types of fossilized sea life. And I realize all of a sudden that the top five layer feet or so of this mesa is fossilized sea life. And I get on top and there are brachiopods sticking out of the ground and 
and, and like coral like you know, on the top of a mountain. And I realize all of a sudden I'm on the bottom of the ocean, on the top of a mountain in the middle of Arizona. And then it, it was like the big wow factor. And then I look over the back side of this mesa about 300 feet down into this valley and the deepest cut in the ravine uh, where the water has come through and washed away was the deepest cut of sandstone. And I see this piece of a, a boulder of sandstone, probably 15 feet wide, and it must have had two or 3,000 tracks running all across it. Wow. And, I, and I knew I'd found this spot. And it was literally a, a section of hillside, maybe two feet thick by 20 feet wide. I don't know how far deep it goes in, but that was the one little spot where these tracks lie. And, I pulled those out pieces and then I ended up selling those and paying my way through art school. That's and, awesome. What a great story. And then yeah. you recently went back and got some more and I have some examples to share with everyone. So let's see. There's a, yeah. you can see those claw marks in there. there. You know, that's authentic because it has lichen on it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and here's another one. Right so, that, so that is the positive. So what's really neat about these the way these layer is that when you have a footprint and then the next layer comes in, when you peel one up, the bottom of the top piece has the claws sticking out and the piece beneath it has the impression. So you literally get the mirror image of the two. Right. And you just sometimes you have to hold it in the right light to get the shadow. Yeah. In there. Yeah. there they are. This one's over here. Let me, let me show you guys one more. You know, I dreamt about going back to this place for 25 years and it took me another two days to find it. That's a great one. That actually has yeah. scratches where the toes have slid down the beach. Yeah, this one's a really cool one. It's got That's several. Great. Those are some big ones. Yeah. So these are for sale if anyone's interested. <laughs> they are for sale. So tell us about some other things that you've gone rock hunting for and some of the better finds that you've dug up? Uh, you know, things aren't always the most valuable, but they're, the, the, the adventure is fun. I was involved in the Discovery Series last year. We went up in Arizona, or Northern Nevada, sorry, and uh, we were looking for gold. And this old guy shows up, his name is Peg Leg Pete, and he has one leg, and uh, he literally has one leg. Uh, and he said, hey, I want to go dig crystals with you. And nobody wanted to go. So I came back about two weeks later and we went digging crystals. And he took me out in the middle of nowhere in the hillsides of northern Nevada. And it doesn't look like anything, just desert. And there are quartz crystals lying everywhere. And I have gone back for a year and ended up filing a claim there and dug a lot of incredible, beautiful crystals. I mean, I get huge, beautiful, clean quartz nice. crystals. That and is really cool. Yeah, and this is a Singer crystal. When you tap it, it makes a chiming sound. It has that really that clarity to it. Neat. And this is also where I found the Nevada Star Crystal, which is my So this crystal is phenomenal. I have never seen anything like it. And we took it around Tucson to all sorts of experts, and they had never seen anything like it, too. And I tell you, when I hold this thing, I feel something really powerful like from another dimension it's intense check it out this so, is the, the call the nevada star crystal and if you can see this in the light so this is a six-sided star embedded in the face dead center in the face of a quartz crystal that i found about three feet beneath the surface and no expert can uh, reason how it got there or what caused it because it doesn't have the shape of any other existing crystal formation. Uh, I have my own theories, but people have said lightning and from space and etc. But anyway, this is the Nevada Star Crystal. Yeah. And, okay. <laughs> have a look while she answers the phone. Oh, sure. Um, how about sh share with everyone some other things that you've found that you can show them, like the sunstone or whatever? All right. Okay, you want to go for 
some of the other interesting things I've found along the way are Oregon sunstones, which are a lot of fun. If you ever get down to Southern Oregon, they are free to go dig in the public area. It's four square miles. And this is a sunstone. And this is one that I slightly polished. And you can see inside it, it's called Schiller. Sunstone is a fairly soft material. It's, it is cuttable. It's about a 6.5 on the hardness scale. And uh, it, the good pieces are red and turquoise-ish color inside. And these little copper inclusions create something called Schiller, which gives it an impression almost of a salmon rolling over in a river. Really neat pieces. Uh, hard to find them colorful and full of Schiller, but they are out there. Oh, okay. yeah. um, one of the things, areas I found, a uh, great place to dig if you're ever down in the Inyo Valley. Sorry, the, um, if you're ever down, are you back? Sorry. <laughs> All right, yeah. you got your order in. <laughs> Just talked about sunstones and a little bit of Schiller inside the- Oh yeah, that's the, gorgeous. The, the oh my gosh. Thing. And uh, if you're ever down in the Owens Valley, which is south of Mammoth, uh, between right around, oh, what's the town there, um, Bishop? The Enya Mountains have a lot of smoky quartz that are, is coming out of there. And I found several small deposits. This is a very small piece, but still not a That's lot of nice. value. With, yeah, but, you know, not a lot of value, but it sure is a rush to dig into a pocket of smoky quartz in the mountains. Uh, yeah. It, it, it's always exciting. Something that I really love, it's not, again, it's not always about pretty. So I've traveled around Iceland twice taking photographs. and. I came across a road cut high in the mountains over a cliff and on the super moon on summer solstice about three years ago. And I decided to hike down to the beach. And when I, about halfway down, I started seeing these white rocks. And I realized that they had, when they had made the mountain cut, they had come into a deposit of Icelandic agate, which is really rare. And I started finding these huge chunks. And this is one of the pieces I found, which has these oh, crystallized wow. bugs inside it. Neat. And again, it's not a very valuable mineral, but it's just really cool to have a piece of Icelandic mineral in my collection. And I, I love this piece. It looks really nice when it's cleaned up and I used to have some little figures glued to it. <laughs> this is one of my favorite pieces as well. Oregon Thunder Eggs are, you can go dig them. I don't, are they open at the right currently? Um, Not the Richardson's Ranch, but there's uh, lots of other places to dig the Thunder Eggs. Okay. I went to Richardson's Ranch several years ago and, and found a lot of the standard solid looking uh, Thunder Eggs and I found a small pocket of these. And what makes these really unique is they are hollow Thunder Eggs. And they still have the original tentacles that formed from basically it's a stalactite inside and mm -hmm. then they solidified over with agatized with um, opalization. So you can see inside there, they're this beautiful luminescent rainbow color. It nice. got a little broken when I opened it, but it's just a really, really unique piece that uh, I've never seen before. And it has two little sidecars that <laughs> who knows what's cool. hiding inside this. <laughs> yeah. So that's just a fun, unique piece. Nice. So how do you decide where are you going to go dig for something? Like, how do you decide what you want to go dig for? You know, I'm always trying to go for something of value because it takes a tremendous amount of effort to find these things and dig them up. Uh, to the date, I would say the Nevada Star is probably the most, the most valuable. I did find with a friend about three years ago, again, it depends on value because I do want to pay for the trip and I want to find something cool myself. Uh, we found example sunstone is it grows you find sunstone inside a volcanic flow in the lava pockets and it's always fractured so to find it in a crystallized form that has points is nearly impossible but uh, I was with a friend and we dug open a pocket of sunstone deep red sunstone and it was about 400 carats in one big cluster. And I was able to sell that last year at Tucson for about $5,000. That was wow. a great find and that, that paid for the trip. Nice. Um, as far as, I mean, a lot of these things don't have a lot of value that I'm finding in the West Coast. Uh, it's not the, I would say it's not the most valuable region, but it's probably one of the most fun regions to explore. This is one of my also monster quartz crystals that came out of Nevada. 
Nice. That's I have videos big. on my Instagram. Yeah, it's fully terminated all the way around. And when it was coming up to temperature, I heard it crack. See the fracture through the middle? Yeah, wow. It was really cold, and as it was warming up in the car, it popped under pressure. Oh, man. So I learned a valuable lesson about that. <laughs> yeah. So what would you do to prevent that from happening? Uh, I would leave it outside and let it warm up kind of slowly. I think I just accelerated it by having it in a warm car, and that, that was a little tragic. Uh -huh. um, anything else I... Uh, I have these little rocks that I showed you, Susan. Uh, this little deposit I found in the central the lake bed of Oregon. I call them eclipse stones, and they look like a solid black obsidian rock. Uh, but they, I find them in the middle of the desert, and they're usually on a little pedestal of dirt because everything else is eroded away. And when you hold these up to light, they're translucent and almost see-through. So they go from black to light. They're really neat little pieces. Do you have a flashlight handy? Uh, I do. Give me two seconds. <laughs> Let me find a really good one here. Some of them are more opaque than others. They're really cool. He gave me one and I never seen anything like it. Yeah, I don't think, oh, here we go. So this is what I would call an eclipse stone when it's in its solid black mode. And this is what happens when you light it. You can literally see. Yeah, it's translucent. It's completely translucent. You see the flashlight through that. Yeah, and otherwise it's, it's opaque black. It's really cool. It's considered a pseudo tektite, which is a tektite is when a piece falls from space and then is blown up into the air and then turns, gets pocketed and falls down as a solid. These are more than likely caused by a volcanic explosion and they teardrop in the air, kind of like an Apache tear. Uh, very near that place, I recently found a huge agate deposit, which is, again, not real valuable, but just beautiful botroidal. And botroidal oh, yeah. is uh, these beautiful little nodules of. Uh -huh. form and this is also uh opalized inside so it has that kind of rainbowy quality this is all southern oregon material cool that's fun so you talked about making a claim you made a claim for the quartz crystal mine so yeah. can you share with people how that works how do you make a claim you know i, I it was a kind of a the whole mapping thing is an interesting discussion because if you want to go out and dig and find minerals and you find something valuable, you have to make sure that you're not on private land. You have to make sure that it is public land, like BLM specifically. You also have to make sure that um, it's available and there are no mining claims on that as well. And it is a very difficult process because all of the technology and the mapping systems are old. So I will go on a piece of land like the quartz crystal location and I will map it and then I will go back and I will look at um, property ownership maps. I will look at BLM maps. I will overlay those with mining maps and it takes me four or five different maps to conclude whether something's available. Once you determine it is available, it's relatively simple. You go out and you stake your claim and that's literally putting stakes in the ground and there's some laws about that, how they have to be I use hollow metal pipe, certain height with the caps so birds and animals can't go inside them. You mark the four corners. Uh, there are two types of claims. There is a plaster claim, which is where material has been left, like a glacier would leave gold, or you have a vein, uh, which is a solid material that ex exists in the ground, and that's a different type of claim, and they're different shapes, but they're all 20 acres. So you mark those corners. One of them, you put a piece of paper in a and a tube that talks about your, the, the corner locations, talks about your name, your address, all this is available online. And then you take your map and your information into the local county, most the closest uh, location where you're filing at the county seat and you file that with them and then they turn around and file that as well with uh, BLM and to get it into, um, it. what's neat about it is a claim only costs about $165 a year. And as long as you continue to pay, you can have that claim forever and it's yours. 
you can't live on it. You could live on it if you were working on it full time, but you can't just build a house on and hang out. You have to actually be doing a mining activity and then work with BLM and any of the permissions that are required to. It's not a big process and it's actually relatively simple and fun. It was intimidating at first, but you know, it's a, it's a cool process to learn. That's, that's really good information. Thanks, Clark. Yeah, that's so, a long-winded answer. <laughs> that's okay. Um, you were on a prospecting show last year, uh, prospecting for gold. And uh, I know it wasn't the best um, experience you've ever had, but maybe you could share a little bit with people about what it was like. Uh, the television part or the digging for gold part? Whatever you want to share. <laughs> Uh, I was brought onto a discovery series. It was a spinoff of Gold Rush with a friend of mine who used to be on Gold Rush. And we had shot some pilot short episodes for the web, our own series called Great American Prospectors. And you can see those on YouTube. And it was a fun thing to do and Discovery liked it. So they picked up the show. And so I got on the show as his partner, one of his partners. Uh, everything kind of changed once the show started. A lot of money was involved, a lot of people. And my job was to find the gold and they would dig it up. And then I also was running the gold room at the end, which is running the machinery that vibrates the gold out of the final slurry into the, the concentration, out of the concentration. And uh, it was a real toss up between doing what the camera crew wanted me to do and doing what I was being asked to do on the crew as far as finding gold, because you're, you're under pressure to find gold and actually make some money and you're under pressure to get good television. So often being asked to repeat a line or say something or do something that you might have already done or might set up another scenario. Um, I would say they shouldn't call it reality TV. They should call it 50% reality TV. <laughs> yeah, and I did not have a good experience. So if you do watch it, uh, it's been cut and edited to appear the way they want to tell the story. And I would say that nobody gets a real fair shake. And when you go on, you just kind of sign up for that and hope for the best. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, so. Well, thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Uh, so you're just an amazing guy because you do so many different things and you've worked a lot in television, commercial, film, doing creative work. Can you share a little bit about that part of your life? Oh, the money making part of my life. Uh, I've yet to make money in minerals. Maybe it's someday. <laughs> That's something you can talk about. You've done so well for yourself and built this incredible store. And if you've never gone into Susan's store, please go. It's, it's the best mineral store I've ever been into. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's great. And you know your stuff. Uh, I've been in film and TV for 25 years and I burned out pretty badly. I had 35 employees up to a few years ago and we did Grimm for NBC which was pretty intense for six years. Uh, we would have uh, finished shots on Thursday that would go to air on Friday. So we were really scrambling all the time to meet deadlines. And I just burned out. And that's when I started getting back into minerals and saying what, uh, what's really important to me and what's exciting and being out in nature and grounded was so much more interesting than film and TV. I still freelance in it and still work in it. Uh, but if I could, if I can find a way to make a living in minerals for the rest of my life, uh, I, I think I may be inclined to do that because I get to spend a lot of time outdoors and very few computers. <laughs> and your main thing was special effects, right? Yeah, I was a commercial director for many years and then I also uh, did a lot of visual effects supervision. Uh, special effects on a movie are practical. Those happen in real time like explosions. And then visual effects happen in post-production where we add smoke and creatures and that kind of work. Primarily animation and visual effects are my specialties in medium. Mediums. And then you also worked uh, for a while at the Will Vinton Studios. Maybe a lot of viewers are uh, mm -hmm. familiar with the M&M commercial that was really popular for a while that you worked on. Yeah, yeah. they did the Domino's Noid and the Raisins and, and Clay. And right after I came in, right as I came in, I was 24. Um, this is before Toy Story. That's kind of dating me at this point. And we are just starting to do CG animation or 3D animation and we got the M&M's account. So when I was 24, I had the opportunity to be a lead animator on those commercials. And that kind of, that led to my whole career and um, all the, I mean, I've done a lot of really cool, fun things. A lot of my work is available on my website. It's kind of a variety of, I do photography for fun and illustration for fun. And then all my visual effects, animation, directing work is on there. 
uh, if anybody's curious and wants to see how you burn out and get into minerals. <laughs> we could post the links to your websites uh, in the comments. Um, so do you have any tips for people that want to go rock hunting at all? Like, you know, the, the biggest question I get, I get this question a lot is where do I go? And there are two types, I think of mineral. Well, three, I'm going to say three. There is the, the unknown. This is just literally going out and looking at terrain and exploring places that maybe not have been explored before. And the second one is going to known areas and there's a lot of books. Susan has a lot of books in her store from all different states that tell you where to go. And these are kind of rock hounding, the, the more touristy, I guess, rock, hound, rock hunting places. And sometimes there's good stuff and sometimes there's not. Uh, the third one is mining. If people have existing claims and you can go on their claims or into old claims that don't exist anymore, you can find claims that have expired and go and, and know what the history is. I prefer to go find new stuff. And I'm always surprised where I will be out in the middle of nowhere on a mountainside in Nevada, just exploring. And I'll come across a zone of red rock in the middle of nowhere, and it will be covered with pieces of fossilized log. And I had no idea it was there. It wasn't in a book. And then I'll go across the valley and I'll find, I'll find stuff like this, like mine shafts with beautiful pieces of chrysocolla and, um, uh, azurites and malachites and and they're and they're just random in, in, and those are not places that are on any map so oops, I want to break that uh, my recommendation is if you don't know where to go you start out with one of the books from Susan's store or go online and look at each state has a BLM listing of what of what's available in public and then know the terrain and understand the geology a little bit you'll know that there is other material and what type it is in that area oregon is mostly volcanic so you're going to have things like obsidian you're going to have sunstone you're going to have um, opal some opal and then you get into northern california you get into gold country which is more quartz crystal smoky quartz and uh, then you get into Nevada and Arizona, you're gonna get into the copper minerals. You're gonna get into azurites and malachites and um, turquoises. And, and each state kind of has its own thing. Utah has a lot of fossils. I would say they're primarily known for fossils um, and some good agate out there. But and, does that give you a good, that good, a good answer? Yeah, and in terms of equipment, like a rock pick and a bucket, is there anything else? You know, I always carry a backpack. It's about 30 pounds, but I have uh, shovels. I have rock picks, hammer picks. Um, my favorite, favorite, two favorite tools to work with, three actually, is I have a hammer with a pick on one end and a flathead on the other, and then a small three pound sledge. And then I put the tip of the one hammer in the rock and I use the sledge to hammer that and I can shape and sculpt and pop rocks in the direction I want to go. But I would say that the most useful tool of all is one of those short, all natural whisks or brushes, like a little broom from a uh -huh. department store. They get worn down over time, but that is the most useful tool for digging crystals because it won't damage them and you can brush dirt out of the way and clean things and see where you are. Um, I always carry a lot of screwdrivers. Uh, long, long pointy screwdrivers are great to use. Um, Gloves. I go through a lot of gloves. Oh, I, right. Gloves. Once you split your fingertips, <laughs> it takes weeks to heal and you can't touch anything. And so I used to buy cheap gloves and now I get leather gloves, cowhide. And the first thing I do is I duct tape them or put some kind of protection oh. because they will wear out in the day of hunting crystals. Wow. Um, that's really good information. Thank you. Yeah. One of the thing I, two other things I love is knee pads. And then I always take a furniture pad. Often I'll find myself upside down in a hole and it's really difficult to get down in there. It's uncomfortable and rocky. So I will often have this, this blanket laid down inside there. And often if, if you have material above you, you don't want to, you don't want it to be, you don't want to crawl in a hole. So it's called overburden. So you're always cleaning that off. So I will tuck that blanket down in the hole and then I will knock all the overburden off onto the blanket and then fold it up and then drag that out and dump the material and it keeps it from falling into your hole because it's nothing worse than having to continuously dig out this nice hole full of crystals where you're working. 
Wow, so, that's good to know. <laughs> and a hat and sunblock, right? <laughs> a hat and sunblock. Uh, I often will use one of those little tents or shelters for the beach to keep the sun off of you. Uh, mm -hmm. I wear a straw hat when I'm out in the countryside too, uh, working it's lightweight. Um, always have a light on you because you want to shine it into something, through something, and a hole gets dark. You want to be able to find your way home. Lights are a great resource uh, that way. Yeah. Um, that's right. Also, it gets cold at night too. Often, I will I'll come out of a hole, in the, you know, ten or eleven at night, and it will be below freezing. And so, oh, yeah, Burr. you got to be protected. <laughs> oh gosh! Wow, that was great. Thank you for all that. So, what's your next adventure? Your next prospecting adventure? Uh, last, well, yeah, last May I was uh, coming back through a round trip digging, and I went into the mountains in Utah. And there is a place called uh, Topaz Mountain. It's a public place. Uh, it's very di fairly difficult to find topaz there, but I found a giant boulder full of topaz crystals. And I bought a recently bought a little miniature explosive kit where you use air cylinders and drive these little dynamite sticks. And so my goal is to go back and drill holes in that boulder and blow it to little pieces and find all the topaz I can. Oh, that sounds good. Topaz is a good one. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. just looking to see if anybody had any questions. Because I, I told people to write, put the questions in the, you know, the Facebook post that I made. Mm -hmm. But I'm not seeing any. But we'll check the uh, feed after we post it and see if anybody has any questions. And we could always answer after the fact. Sounds good. Thanks for putting me on camera with COVID here. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> this is four months worth <laughs> well thank you so much for joining us i really appreciate all your time and your experience and wisdom that you shared with us today thank you for all your uh, coaching and support over the years and it's always good to go see you at the shows and check out the new stuff with you yeah we have lots of fun thanks for having me on your show <laughs> you're welcome take care see you bye bye